As World War II drew to a close in Europe, many on the Axis side preferred to avoid capture. For many SS complicit in harsh occupation policies or war crimes, they naturally sought ways to avoid falling into Allied hands. Many had been preparing for such an eventuality for months. Many ordinary German soldiers feared retribution by the Allies, or being tarred with the same brush as the SS, but avoiding capture for these men was unlikely. The best that most German servicemen could hope for was to fall into British or American hands, rather than the Soviets, as the latter ensured often a one-way trip to Siberia, or worse. The Navy managed to get a few U-boats to sea as Germany collapsed, but they all, with two exceptions, surrendered soon after the end of the war. The other two turning up in Argentina a few months after hostilities ended but one section of the German armed forces possessed the means to escape from the Allies, as by early May 1945, entire occupied nations were on the verge of either being overrun by the Allied advance or surrendered by German generals keen to end the bloodshed. The Luftwaffe still had hundreds of aircraft operational throughout Europe, and with the means to escape the capitulation, how many aircrew would avail themselves of such an opportunity? By the 2nd of May 1945, the territory still remaining in German hands was rapidly shrinking. In the east, Berlin had just fallen to the Soviets. While German forces still controlled pockets of eastern Germany and Czechoslovakia, as well as most of Austria. In the west, a large portion of northern Germany was still in German hands, along with half of the Netherlands and all of Denmark and Norway. The Germans also controlled some of Bavaria and a few besieged French ports on the Channel coast as well as the Channel Islands, the only part of Britain captured by Hitler. Defections of German aircrew had already started, some deciding to fly directly into the arms of their enemies. For example, on the 2nd of May, a Junkers Ju-188A of Kampfgeschwader 26 took off from Norway and flew across the North Sea to Fraserburgh in Scotland, the crews surrendering the aircraft and becoming prisoners of war. Perhaps they figured it was better to surrender in Britain than to surrender in Norway, and feared being turned over to the Norwegians in any post-war decisions regarding prisoners. On the same day, a Junkers 88 G6 night fighter had flown out of Lech in northern Germany with a crew of only two, and landed later that same day in Porto, a coastal city in northwest Portugal, and were interned. Around the same time, in Denmark, a German pilot was wrestling with a problem. Oberfeldwebel, or senior sergeant, Herbert Giesecker, was worried that if the British took him prisoner, he would be punished. Why? Because before the war, Giesecker had left Berlin and moved with his wife to South Africa, part of the British Empire. When war broke out, all Germans of military age were supposed to return to the Reich and enlist, but Giesecke put this off for many months until relatives in Germany pressured him to return, and he enlisted in the Luftwaffe. By 1945, Giesecke was a night fighter pilot with six bomber kills under his belt, flying the Junkers Ju-88 G6C in Night Fighter Squadron 3 based at Grover, Denmark. This had earned him the Iron Cross first and second class. Giesecke, whose wife was still living in South Africa, feared that the British, who were poised to occupy Denmark, would hand him over for punishment to the South Africans. His fears were probably unfounded, but nonetheless he approached his squadron commander, Herbert Koch, asking for permission to avoid British capture. Koch told him that he would have to wait until after the German surrender, which appeared to be imminent, otherwise he would be charged with desertion, as Germany was still at war. But Giesecke decided to take matters into his own hands on the 5th of May. The question was where to fly to. Switzerland or Spain were both possibilities, as was nearby Sweden, and Luftwaffe aircraft would indeed turn up in all three locations over the next few days. But Giesecke, who spoke English, had a better idea. There was one other neutral nation, a place where German aircrew had been well treated earlier in the war, the Republic of Ireland. 
Ireland remained neutral throughout World War II, though thousands of her men joined the British Army to fight against the Germans. Many German aircraft crashed in Ireland during the war, shot down by flak or fighters over British territory, Northern Ireland being heavily bombed. Indeed, the Germans also accidentally bombed the Irish capital of Dublin, mistaking it for Belfast, causing extensive damage and casualties. Nonetheless, Ireland scrupulously followed the terms of the Geneva Convention and interned the aircrews of both German and British planes that landed on her soil, placing these enemies into different sections of the same camp, the Curra, which was a bizarre situation to say the least. So Ireland it would be, declared Giesecke, a decision supported by his crew, Gefreiter Bernhard Krutscheiner and Unteroffizier Horst Schmidt. But in choosing Ireland, Giesecke had decided on a tricky destination fraught with real dangers, for to reach Ireland would involve flying across Britain. The last German air attack on Britain had only ended on the 17th of March 1945, when a solitary German aircraft had bombed the city of Hull. Anti-aircraft batteries, radar and defensive fighters were still on full alert to intercept and shoot down intruders. However, at 0515 hours, Danish time, on the 5th of May 1945, just a couple of days before the German surrender, Giesecke's Junkers 88 lifted off from Grover and headed west. Flying out into the North Sea, presumably at low level to avoid Allied radars and patrolling fighters, Giesecke made landfall in England at Middlesbrough on the northeast coast then flew across the intervening high ground to the city of Liverpool on the west coast of England, and then out into the Irish Sea. The Junkers 88 was of course seen and reported multiple times from the ground, but because it was hammering along below radar coverage, determining its course was very difficult, and vectoring fighters onto it even more so. He now skirted northern Irish airspace and then into the Republic, setting course for Gormanston Airfield in County Meath. At 0517 hours local time, Giesecke landed the big Junkers 88 to be greeted by astonished Irish and surrendered himself and his crew to the authorities. As he had predicted, the Irish treated the Germans well and they were interned until just after the war. The Irish reported the Junkers 88's arrival to the British, and not long afterwards, famous Royal Navy test pilot Captain Eric Brown arrived to fly the aircraft to England, where it ended up being extensively tested at RAF Tangmere until 1947. In the meantime, Giesecke and his crew were released and returned to Germany, from whence Giesecke took a ship to South Africa and there was reunited with his wife and where he lived for the rest of his life. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.